This talk is about the diamond scheme done with uh, my supervisor, Robert McLaughlin, uh, for my PhD thesis. This is in France, we're on a peninsula. Waves are coming in from the left and right, making a neat grid-like pattern. The PDE that models, not that pattern, but rather the individual waves, is the KDV equation. It's first order in time and third order in the space derivatives there. Here we have a numerical simulation of a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is really cold atoms. The uh, spiral shape is uh, showing the time evolution uh, of the simulation. And the PDE that uh, models all this, or actually what the simulation is, is using, is the Schrodinger equation. Uh, first order in the, with the time derivative there, and inside the H is uh, some space derivatives, you know, normally the Laplacian, so I've got second order there. Well, now, what do those uh, PDEs have in common? Well, they can both be written in this form. This is uh, looks a bit simpler. There's only first order time and first order in space derivatives, so how can we get those PDEs into this form? Well, uh, the Z here is actually a vector. Right, it's a function of time and space, uh, and that maps to a vector in Rn. And the K and L are matrices. They're actually skew symmetric matrices. Now, I'll give you an example of how to get a, an equation, uh, the wave equation here, into that form. So we start there with the wave equation, add two dummy variables, V and W. Now we can substitute those back in for UT and UX, and we get that. So three first order equations, bundle them all up into a matrix equation. We've got K as the first matrix and L the second one. Uh, they're skew symmetric and we're in that multi-Hamiltonian form. So hopefully I've convinced you that this equation is worth looking at because we can write a bunch of PDEs in that form. Now I want to tell you some, some special property of this equation. If we take the first variation of the equation, we get this. Now dz is in the tangent space at z and uh, it's uh, just a vector in local coordinates. Now we can do a bit of manipulation to the equation, pre-multiplying by dz wedge and essentially, or well, basically, we get down to this um, in a few steps. This is the multi-symplectic conservation law. Now, any solution of the multi-Hamiltonian also satisfies this multi-symplectic conservation law. So it's, a, it's an intrinsic part of the PDE. And any numerical method which solves, or approximately solves the multi-Hamiltonian should, or it would be beneficial anyway, to satisfy a discrete version of this conservation law. And indeed, that's what the diamond scheme is um, attempting to do. So this is really what, what, what we're talking about here. It's a multi-symplectic integrator. Now by that, I mean I've misspelled multi there, sorry, but anyway. Um, the integrator means it's a numerical method. Um, it's going to be finite difference. And the um, uh, symplectic, multi-symplectic means that it will, um, it will, the solutions it produces will satisfy a discrete version of that multi-symplectic conservation law. Now, I always forget um, to mention this, and so I will write now that the boundary conditions for the PDE, we will assume the periodic for now. Um, later on, we will we'll, we'll relax that a bit, but when we're talking about PDEs, really should talk about the boundary conditions as well. 
Okay, so finite differences, all right? Let's have a look how to solve a PDE with finite differences. This is the usual approach. You discretize the domain, uh, and you break it up into little rectangles, delta x wide and delta t high, um, and you you approximate the, uh, t the derivatives in the PDE with a difference, equa difference equations on this grid. You start at the bottom where time is zero and you, you, you work yourself up the grid. So here's an um, example cell here. The blue circles are where we know the solution or our approximate solution and we have to work out what's going on at those red triangles. Here, here it is enlarged, so we can see what's going on. Now we want a time derivative, first order. Yeah, so that really is um, solution at the top minus solution at the bottom. That would be an okay approximation. But we don't have a solution at the top. We have Z3 and Z4. So we just take the average, and we do that all the way around. So we've got Z top as the average of the Zs, and Z bot as the average at the bottom. So we just take the difference. And there are our time derivatives and our uh, time derivative and our space derivative approximations. So we can just put those into the equation, and off we go. So this method that we have just uh, just dreamt up now, it's a very common scheme. Now you may notice that the Z2 and Z4 of this particular um, rectangle are actually the Z1 and 3 of the neighboring rectangle and similar going to the other way, going to the left. So all the, um, all the cells here are all coupled together and that makes for a really big implicit solve that is sometimes not even solvable. And I think that's why there's so many papers written about this, because you have to prove it's solvable for each particular PDE interest in. It's also only second order. Now, what if we want a higher order method? Well, we can get a higher order method by, we've got as much data as we want along the bottom, right, along that blue line. As long as we propagate that forward to the top of the, the rectangle, then the whole scheme will work. Now, people have come up with schemes like this, but it suffers from the same problem as the second order method. It's often implicit and it's not solvable, and it's even less likely to be solvable and more, more um, complicated to show that anyway. And really the problem is that we, or the problem that I feel the problem is that we only have data along that one edge. It would be really nice if we had data along more than one edge. It, sh it should make for a better scheme. So that's where the inspiration of the diamond scheme comes from. Here we discretize with diamonds, right? Again, delta x cross, delta t up. Um, and you'll see, look at those diamonds at the bottom along that blue line. It, well, you can see that we know data along two edges out of each diamond. But you'll also notice that the x-axis cuts those initial diamonds in half. So we need some sort of bootstrap scheme to get the data up onto that blue zigzag. But then we're away. Have a look at this, just an example diamond. Suppose we know the information at those blue circles, and we need to know what's up at the red triangle. All right, I'll show you how it works. Here it is enlarged, and you can see it's not particularly complicated. The time derivative, we've approximated it with z at the top minus z at the bottom, and the space derivative z at the right and z at the left. Um, and the, the middle there is just the average of the values around. So there's our simple diamond scheme. Now, how do we initialize it? Well, one way, and the simplest way, is to use forward oiler. That's a very simple method, and it will get the solution from that x-axis up onto those red triangles. I've given you the formula there. There are other ways of doing it, but um, that's the most, that's the simplest. Okay, and what about the boundary? Because as you've noticed, the boundary is actually similar to the, um, the well, the, the x-axis too, um, we, we've cut the diamonds in half, right? So how do we deal with this boundary? Well, remember, it's periodic boundary conditions. So that's what we're going to use. Okay, this is how the scheme works. So we don't know what's going on at the red triangles, but we use forward oiler or some method, and we've got those solved. Now what do we do? Look at that first diamond. We can solve that diamond uh, because we've got the three points here, three blue points. So we solve them to get the red... Um, triangle, solved. Same with this diamond, solved. What about that point? Oh, there's no diamond there. Let's just make a phantom diamond. 
Now, uh, we don't know two points, but that point on the outside of the domain, we, through the periodic boundary conditions, we copy it from there. So over it goes, we know that point. And now look, we know three points in that diamond. So we can solve. And we can copy that back over there by periodicity. So now we're back to that first stage, essentially. We know everything along the bottom. But we don't have to use forward Euler now. We can actually just use the diamond scheme. And I've done all these solves in parallel because they're all independent. Right, the diamond, each diamond you can solve independently. There we go, and we're solved. And the scheme can just continue on up. This is just showing that it's actually solvable, and this is showing the order, which is second order. Don't worry about the details. Um, but well, let's look at the details for this. This is the multi symplectic um, part. So the multi Hamiltonian satisfies that conservation law. Our scheme satisfies this. Now, you might think, oh, that looks big and messy. Let's look at it bit by bit. That time derivative has been replaced by this difference, yeah? And the space derivative is by that difference. Now, the time difference is that stuff underlined in red, which is involves the, the, the top three nodes. I've colored them at the bottom in that diamond, so the, the red one's near the top. And then we minus off the three the lower half. And similarly for the space, three on the right, one's three on the left. So there is our um, discrete form. It's not, um, uh, yeah, okay. So it's a discrete form. Now I've mentioned a few times that the simple diamond scheme you can solve within one diamond, independent of the other diamonds. So th this means that on the boundary, we might be able to cook up different schemes if we have to handle different boundary conditions, right? So we're not doing periodic boundary conditions now. Let's try and deal with different ones. Um, there's not enough conditions on the boundary uh, to actually solve for a diamond. So there's some strategies we might use to solve the diamond on the boundary. I'll give you some examples. So here's the wave equation. Remember the wave equation we talked about right at the beginning? So we've got U and V, V is UT and W is UX. Now, I suppose we've got Dirichlet boundary condition on the left. So this is the situation we've got. We know the data at the blue squares. That's come from the previous diamond, the dashed diamond. And we need to know the solution up at the red triangle. Okay, so we need to know U. Well, the Dirichlet boundary condition gives us U. It's, that's actually what the boundary condition is. And then F, uh, sorry, it equals F, and then V, what is V? Well, V is the time derivative of U. So we can just differentiate the boundary condition. So we've got V. And I've also put in what V is at the middle of that um, uh, triangle there, or middle of the, down the edge there, because we'll use that here. So what's W? Well, W, we can approximate it. I should have written approximate there, but the whole thing's a bit approximate anyway. Um, is W at the bottom plus delta T times the time derivative of W in the middle. And just a simple extrapolation up there. And what's time derivative of W? Well, we can use the PDE here. We, and we know that um, WT is actually UXT, which is UTX, which is VX. Okay, just simple swapping the first, um, the order of the derivatives. And we know what VX, well, we can approximate what VX is in the middle by V at the right minus V in the middle. So. We're just using first order approximations all the way through here. And for the simple diamond scheme, that's fine. It's second order scheme. And we're only approximating on this little edge here. What about Neumann? Uh, now we're on the right-hand boundary. Here we've got UX is given, which is W. We've given that. Um, we're going to use a phantom diamond. We know the solution at the blue squares from the previous diamond. If we could get the solution at the red dot, we'd be done, right? We know stuff in the middle. We know UX and we know VX by differentiating respect to time, and we know what W is. Now we just do linear extrapolation or, um, and for the W, we just sort of take an average there and get the solution on the blue square. So we're finished now, right? We can use our normal diamonds, diamond scheme to go up to the top. Right, here we are trying it out um, on a, Simple problem here. So Dirichlet on the left and Neumann on the right. 
the, the figure in the top left should be a circle. And if the figure on the top right is an enlargement of a part of that circle, and you can see that the points are fairly tightly clustered. And we've done tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of iterations here. Um, so it, you, you'd, you'd think it would have drifted off by now if it was going to drift off. And the bottom left is the energy. Looks pretty nicely bounded there. And the bottom right is the error in you at the right hand side. And note, we're not fixing you at the right hand side. It's a Neumann condition. So, so that's, that's, that's just coming from the solution there. Okay, that's a summary of the diamond scheme, simple diamond scheme. I won't even read it because I've just told you two minutes ago about it. Okay, what if we wanted a higher order scheme, which is one of, one of our goals. Um, so this is the diamond scheme, not the simple one. Here we use the same flow of information working our way up, but we just use a higher order scheme within each diamond. So here's a, here's a diamond, and here it is on the next screen. Let's look what we're going to do within this diamond. First we chuck out the corners. This scheme is defined on the edges, not the corners. There are, we introduce R, R known points on each of the lower edges. Okay, so as R gets bigger, um, hopefully the scheme will get more accurate. Right? There's R points at the top on each edge. They're the ones we need to work out within each diamond. We introduce this this grid of internal stages R by R. Now, what's really going under the going on under the covers here is is R runger cutter schemes in one direction and R runger cutter schemes are going the other direction. And so we end up with a R by R grid there of internal stages. We do do some solving and those internal stages are now known. And now we can do our runger cutter updates in one direction in the other direction. Phew, we've got it now. We've got everything known at the top. We can now chuck out the stuff inside. Um, and those equations uh, that we used for solving the stuff inside, they're quite messy. Uh, but it is really just two uh, runger cut equations all coupled together. And I, I don't want to show you what, what's going on there, or, but it's nothing um, mysterious anyway. Um, and what I've described really is the Reich scheme, Sebastian Reich scheme. He, he cooked this up, uh, but it was on squares, not diamonds. And I've just shown you a translated diamond, okay? Um, and of course, in practice, when we're solving it, we actually do a transformation back to the unit square and solve on there. So we're back to the right scheme. However, in the right scheme, he only knows data along one edge. We know along two edges. And that really is the critical thing. The actual scheme within a diamond is not so critical. It's the, it's the geometry, really. It's the, the, it's the way we're laying it out and doing the solve. Um, and, yeah, okay, we can define a solution at the corners if, if, if you want. And that's something that I... Um, I'm always keen on because that's where, the, where you want the solution actually. Um, but it's not, the scheme doesn't rely on the, the corner values. Okay, here is uh, some, uh, an error plot of, um, of the scheme. I'm showing as delta t decreases there, the error goes down, and this is for different r values. And um, I have fixed the axes equal. So you can actually see that order of the scheme by just looking at the slope of those lines. So the, the order is, is either R or R plus 1. But here is a plot showing the speed up when I run it in parallel, which is one of the features of this, is the diamond scheme, you can run, run it in parallel. And the perfect speed up would be that blue line. Uh, and so far, we're quite close to the blue line. As the problem gets, um, as we get more and more pores, it will diverge. But anyway, it, 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 it's quite pleasing. So here's a summary of the properties. I've shown you the order. I've shown you how you can, it can run in parallel. These things I haven't talked about. So I'll just quickly tell you that the R equals one, that's when you only know the midpoints of the edges. And the simple diamond screens are equivalent in a certain way. There is a discrete conservation law. It, we've proved that it's solvable for a nonlinear wave equation. Uh, and you, we can deal with non-periodic boundary conditions uh, in, in a particular way. And actually, you can use that for the initialization scheme as well. Um, and we have done dispersion uh, study on it. And you can check when the scheme is stable. And for the linear wave equation, it's stable when the delta t over delta x is less than equal to 1, which is what you'd kind of expect. So conclusions, uh, instead of 
coming up with schemes for all those different equations. We can write that, those equations in this form and then come up with one scheme. Traditionally, people use a grid like this. Where everything's coupled together. We use a grid like this and you can solve them one diamond at a time. And it means it's actually solvable. Uh, you can deal with other boundary conditions easier. It's faster and it's not a fully explicit method though. It's, um, it's implicit within each diamond. Um, which, which should lead to improved stability over fully explicit. And because it's a linear scheme, there's a bunch of um, things that um, bonuses because it's linear, I suppose. So thank you for your attention.